Um, hi, really happy to be back. Um, 2016 was the last year and a lot of things have changed, a lot of things have stayed the same, but um, I think I have something new um, that changed my ideals during this stint in Web3. I am still in Web3, Web3 is still very active. Of course, the AI buzzword has overshadowed it and many people have you know, pivoted their, their uh, priorities. It all depends on what you're mainly interested in. And this is why this talk might not resonate with a lot of you because a lot of you might not have the ideals that drive me to this ecosystem, which is fine. Uh, for most people, it is totally okay to um, just essentially want to build something really quickly, put something out, and not really care about the underlying principles or longevity of the app. As long as it makes money now, as long as it's successful now, that's great. We have a business, we have to keep running the business. The business needs to make money. Let's go, go, go. No time for, for you know, ideals or be revolutionaries and so on. I am in this for the revolution, kind of, um, because uh, I got kind of pissed off at many of the middlemen in our, in our kind of industry of development where... Um, as, as we add more and more dependencies, more and more third parties, more and more middlemen into the mix, um, each of them turns into a single point of failure. And so now you have a chain that keeps cracking all the time in every single part of the stack, uh, which I got really upset about, especially when politi politics got involved and started cutting the chain in various places, which we'll talk about a little bit. So before we get to progressive centralization, I want to tell you what this is actually about. Um, so we do have to cover the dirty word of, of blockchain and Web3 in general. Well, Web3 mostly. Blockchain doesn't really apply that much here, at least not in the, in the context that you know it as. Um, so how did we actually get here? Um, do, we're, primarily, we're talking about middlemen. We're talking about intermediaries. And for as long as humanity could stand on their own two legs, we knew that we couldn't really trust each other. Humans could never trust each other. Human humans have always hated each other and have wanted to cheat one another out of some deal somehow. And so we needed intermediaries to do the deals for us to make sure that both parties get what they agreed on. Um, and so if, if we define intermediaries, we know that they basically accept messages from outside sources. You know, a person will take a message from this guy, this guy, and then mediate. Um, they act on these messages once they're authenticated. Okay, did you really say this? Did you really say this? Cool. Then the results of these messages need to be computed. So you give me one goat, I give you one gold coin. That's good. We have the computation. And then we need to store that result for later. Ah, you guys traded in the past, so you guys are good. Um, and if that sounds kind of familiar, it's because it's basically a computer, right? You have inputs, outputs, you have storage of information, and retrieval later that again becomes input into something else. But computers can be a lot of things, you know. In, the world, in World War II, a room of women was a computer because all the men went to war and women were doing the calculations for finding the enemy ships or doing government accounting or whatever. And they were all doing manual calculations, splitting the task among many people. But a computer is also, you know, like one little pixel in this screen is equivalent to 10 rooms of these women from the past. Everything can be a computer. There's different types of, of computers that that execute these operations for us. So why have we not replaced these intermediaries with computers completely? Why do we still need them? Um, mainly because in any system of perceivably hoardable power, somebody is going to hoard that power, and we have a problem of authorization and authentication. Um, this can vary from, you know, really complicated authentication me mechanisms to something that uh, you know, some primitive societies like the United States use even today, uh, like just a signature on a piece of paper, and that's okay, and you can take somebody's money. But I also have elliptic uh, curve crypt cryptography, which allows you to prove that you know or own something without actually revealing what you know or own. These are mathematical functions that allow you to mathematically prove that you are the owner of a message or a command or an asset, and this is really cool. Uh, because this is where we're starting to breach into self-custody of information, of owning your information, your data, your preferences, your values, your assets. You are your own bank of value and information here. Um, 
of course, we have abstracted authentication and authorization through the years in many different ways. We have usernames and passwords and biometrics, and we have uh, authentication codes and whatnot. And these, all of these wonderful things have actually allowed us to empower these intermediaries. So you have the ability to send money globally any, to anyone at any point, always it will arrive. You have the ability to stalk your crushes on Instagram. You have the ability to argue with strangers online on Facebook or Meta or whatever it's called and be a keyboard warrior on Twitter and, and find out news and publish your blog all across the world. Uh, and be promoted automatically with that platform, or even do whatever they call um, whatever people do when they use Tinder and OkCupid. Um, you can even collaborate with other people across the world trustlessly on code. You can build code together without actually meeting the person ever, similar to how you can actually also rent out your apartment without actually seeing the person you're renting it out to, and there have been very few problems with that. It's pretty amazing. Like all of this, just 20 years ago, all of this is science fiction. It's pretty nuts where we went just, just through making things simple and easy to use. But there's also no coincidence, in my opinion, that the bank icon resembles a prism because, like I said, any system with perceivably hoardable power will have somebody hoard that power. And when power is hoarded, power can be abused by the person hoarding it or somebody breaking into the system where this power is hoarded and turning it against you. And all of these companies have had their own breaches, problems, and infractions against users. PayPal and TransferWise have been locking accounts left and right without any kind of justification. TransferWise has closed my company's account without justification overnight with money still in it. It took three years to get it back. Um, Instagram had its own metadata leaks that allowed people to stalk others in real time. And Facebook is no stranger to controversy. You all know how many leaks they've had. Um, Twitter uses your ad preferences and everything else against you, though this under new leadership has changed somewhat, so that's pretty good. Medium is a walled garden, not just of reach. They decide who you reach and when, but also of your content type. You can't just pull your content out and take it elsewhere. It's completely proprietary, and it's very difficult to migrate out. Um, Tinder and OkCupid have also had their own leaks, and there have been database matches all across the world, you know, cross-referencing Facebook accounts and so on, and just basically exposing people who are on these platforms and their various kinks. Um, GitHub has, two years ago, I believe, overnight decided to block all Iranian accounts, deleted their forks, repos, mirrors, everything, and all of their work disappeared overnight without warning. Why? Because some um, relatively chubby guy in a suit and a cigar in the US decided I no longer like you, select country, and you will now no longer have access to this service that my country provides. And overnight, they lost this access. The community has rallied around this effort and made public mirrors of this code and allowed people to get their code back. Um, it was a painful process. Many people still lost a lot of work, but it was kind of helped by the community itself. Um, and Airbnb is just generally a single point of failure with that much power in one place. Now governments are coming after Airbnb and saying, no, you may not rent your place anymore. I don't care that you own it. You may not do what you want with it. You must now live in it at least 51% of the year, or you will pay extra tax on it, lose it, or do something else, uh, just because all of this power is concentrated in one place. So we have this problem of really vulnerable, really dangerous intermediaries socially. Not, not even talking about tech yet, just socially. Socially, infrastructurally, this is very, very dangerous. And um, you can't really change that. And as Buckminster Fuller said, you never change things by fighting existing reality. You have to make a new system that makes the old one obsolete. And that is why Web3 came to be. That is why we tried to remove the intermediaries, basically. Um, so if we go way back, the internet in the beginning was just a bunch of wires and a bunch of people saying, why would you ever need to connect to computers? What could computers possibly need to talk about, right? Then we got Web 1.0 where people realized, oh, well, actually you can access quite a lot of information on this. If these computers are all connected and you have some information, I have some information, that turns out it's pretty useful. But then we figured out, like, you can actually write to this internet and have information be dynamic. And so then we got to Web 2.0, which is essentially the read-write web. You have inputs, you have outputs. 
Web development, as we all know, is not really rocket science. It's stuff goes into a box, stuff comes out of a box, the box is a database of various sizes or types, and that's it. Um, and so when you apply this globally, it's a really handy thing. People use it a lot, but here is where we have that intermediary problem because we relegate all the trust to somebody else. If I want to send a message through Facebook to somebody, I have to literally ask Facebook, hey, would you please take this, forward it along for me, and bring it to the destination, uh, at which point Facebook can just say no. And I have nothing I can do. Um, and so Web3 is like a layer on top of this. It's the read, write, trust, verifiable web, where you actually have the ability to verify that you have sent a message, you have the ability to verify the guarantee of that message arriving at its destination. So you know it's gonna get there, you know you've sent it, and you know nobody can tamper with it. And that's all there is to it. And the message, what is a message? A message is just a set of bytes you send. That can be just high, it can be literally money, or it can be some content that somebody doesn't want you to see, you know, like the Chinese firewall. And you can very easily get across it. Now, what, in com what, what actually composes Web3? Uh, three parts. One is linked data. So data that is linked between different computers, just accessible by everyone from everyone. The second point is distributed data. So you have to, you can't just link these data, they, these nodes in the network, you have to also make sure that the data is available for everybody to take. And this, these two parts we've had for a very long time, they're called torrents. You have a lot of spread out data, you can connect to a lot of different peers, get fragments from each of them, assemble it on your computer, and you suddenly have a full file that you've been looking for. Web torrents have existed for a very long time. What's missing is you don't know what you're getting. And this is where trust comes in. So Web3 is just a trust component on top of linked and distributed data. You know what you're getting, it's verifiable. You know that you can trust this information, whether it's your input or your output that you're receiving. You know that you can trust it. It's just the trust layer on top of things. So what is the current state of this Web3 and this intermediation of the internet? Um, it's not too good, right? Um, we have problems, and it hasn't been going in the very uh, positive revolution way that we all wanted it to go in. In fact, um, it could be argued that all it did was allow strangers to rob us trustlessly and anonymously, which is a scary thought. But, I mean, we did, but also it's good that these strangers can rob us because we have this trustlessness. And just like somebody can run you over with a car on a public road, somebody can rob you on the you know, digital superhighway, the internet, it's fine. You just need to train enough good drivers to make that road usable. Um, every new industry is full of cowboys and frauds, and it needs time to normalize, and it needs utilities to normalize, and that utility is currently lacking because it's currently being misused by a lot of bad actors which are out of the scope of this talk. But even if you don't care about this element of trust and this social interaction and this social problem of being in danger from these intermediaries just taking your data, selling it, putting you at risk and so on, even, even if you don't care about any of that, the Web3 stack is an anti-authoritarian stack. It's a stack that allows you to be permanently online. It's a stack that allows you to say, when somebody else tells you, take that website down, you get to say no. And that is what brought me to Web3 and what kept me there. Because nobody is going to tell me to take my website down ever again. Um, so the fact that strangers can rob you is actually good. Because you get this agency, you get this, um, you do have to train yourself to be responsible. You do have to learn new lessons and skills, and you have to, it's a very dangerous area. You have to be responsible for your own information. Um, there's nobody to talk to if you get robbed. There's nobody to bring your money back. There's nobody to bring your credentials back. You are responsible for yourself. You must have good digital hygiene. It, you, it's a must. You must be trained in this. You must learn this. The good news is it's very easy to learn. 
As long as you don't listen to the mass market salesmen or the Ponzi promoters that are rampant uh, in this area, like Croatia and Balkans, as long as you don't go to any event that invites you to go to the event to talk about crypto, you will be safe. Now, meanwhile, the stack, current stack, Web2 stack, is a pile of burning garbage because nobody knows what they're installing anymore. When you pull in a dependency, you pull in 300 gigabytes of dependencies that have nothing to do with what you want to do, just because it's easy and fast. And this is especially dangerous when you're dealing with user-held credentials. If I'm holding the key to my entire wealth with me, then all it takes is one malicious dependency in the stack of 50,000 NPM packages to be malicious, and all my money is gone. That's one bad version upgrade. That's one slip up in the NPM publishing process. That's one hijacked project. And this is not an exception, it's happened. Big wallets, popular wallets that are based on JavaScript have had their packages hijacked, replaced, and people have lost a lot of money in clever ways too. The package would ignore balances below a certain amount so that it can trigger only on higher amounts and get the biggest yield before people notice. So we went, as an industry of web development in general, we went from being able to write a website in Notepad and it working offline, from being able to visit a website we visited a week ago in the Internet Explorer temporary files and it's still working, to Hellstack, which in my opinion, and you may disagree with this, is this. This is one part of the Hellstack. But essentially, you have one dependency wrapping another dependency, wrapping another dependency, wrapping another dependency. It's all wrappers from top to bottom, where each and every one of them is a single point of failure. You're always relegating responsibility to somebody else, and you're always hoping for the best. Ah, AWS won't go down. Ah, Vercel will be up forever. Ah, React will never have a vulnerable package installed. You're always pa passing the ball along to somebody else, and you're always hoping for the best. Not if you're developing for the trust, uh, for the trust verified web. You cannot, so there's a saying in Web3, verify, don't trust. This is 300 gigabytes of trust. This is no good. Because you can't trust humans, you can't trust intermediaries, and you can't trust single points of failure. All of this makes everybody's life more complicated. We used to write manual SQL queries and optimize the indexes by hand, and they would work like crazy. Now, kids wrap it all up in GraphQL and a thousand different packages on top and hope for the best, and that's it. Because when uh, when they use all of this, I understand why. I know that it's really fast to launch an app with these tools. They have templates. They have like one click and you're done. Click, 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 I'm up on Vercel. Who cares where it is? As long as people are clicking on it. They're going to forget about it in three weeks. I have to build a new app, a new app, a new app. People are in a rush. People know that everybody today has ADHD and can't pay attention to an app for a long time. So you have to really pump it out. This is no good. It's okay to sometimes slow down because eventually somebody who's speeding is gonna trip up and lose the race. But in this case, when you lose the race, you lose it badly. It's not a loss like, oops, we had downtime. It's a loss like, oops, we lost $100 million. That's a bigger loss, $100 million of customer money. So when all you have is a hammer of that hell stack, all you get is an authoritarian system where a lot of different people get to tell you a lot of different no. So that when one government that hosts AWS tells you stop, and then another government that hosts your GraphQL database tells you to stop, you have a bunch of people who can tell you to stop. This is not just about your customers. Your customers will be fine. They will find another platform. It just doesn't matter unless they take their money, which is another story. It's about you. Do you want to be able, do you want to be stoppable? Do you care about being unstoppable? Do you care about having control over what you build. That's what this is basically about. And so this is how we get to progressive centralization and how to become immune to it without actually sacrificing usability, usefulness, and just generally the utility of your applications, how, how, whatever purpose they may have. So the, go the, the goal is very simple. The, 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 this is just, it's just a, 
it's not even a stack, it's not, not, not no rules or something. It's just a way to develop things that we are practicing in, in my team and that I'm trying to spread uh, as far as wide and wide as possible to just start decentralized and clunky, then add layers of UX and UI that are centralized but not essential, and then improve at will. What that means is you start with an application that just works. Maybe it works badly, maybe it's slow, maybe it's hard to use, but it works, and it cannot be taken down. Then you add other optimizations on top. You add an indexer for faster fetching, you add other stuff, as we'll see here. So what is this stack? Let's say we have a base layer, right? So you, would, you have a decentralized database, otherwise known as the blockchain, to store information for you. You should not use this like most people use it, who use it wrongly. You should not use it to store everything. This should be used to store Merkle trees, snapshots, hashes of your data that exists elsewhere. You do not store everything here, it doesn't make sense. The blockchain is there for verification, for trustless data interactions, so that you can verify that some call is indeed authorized, authenticated, and true. You do not store every single interaction into the blockchain. That doesn't make sense. It costs a lot of money. But it is unstoppable. And so the crucial checkpoints in your application should be stored on the blockchain. And this is the most resilient backup system ever created. You will never find, well, it depends on which blockchain you use, of course. There are so-called mock chains which go down every other week. You should not use those. But if you use a good blockchain, you will have your data available forever. I'm not talking a few years until a subscription expires. I'm talking forever. And this is a big deal. And you can choose, you know, Ethereum, Polygon, Moonbeam, Base, any one of these is OK. But be careful of these other chains that you know, just wear <clears throat> the costume of a blockchain. That's your database. Your front end, your app, is anything that runs locally. Now, if you prefer to use TypeScript and this script and that script on top and a thousand different compilers and package managers, fine. That's, I mean, your risk to be including all those dependencies, it's okay if you want to. You should take responsibility for that, but it's okay if you want to. As long as the output can be run on your computer. If you can't run it, if you can't open the website by save as website and clicking it while you're offline, it's no good. Then it's not progressive centralization. So it must be available offline. Um, use any framework that you want, that's fine. You know. And then finally, you use for a user system and basically for the world's biggest, baddest, and greatest single sign-on system, you use cryptography. You help users make a crypto wallet, which is essentially just a private key of a pub private public key pair. As long as they hold that private key safely, they will be able to trustlessly log in to any website that is interacting with any blockchain. It's all just math. They don't have to have any currency. They don't have to have anything. They can just use that to log in. You don't have to submit transactions. You don't have to interact with anything. You just verify the hash of the signed message of that cryptographic key, and it, the user is logged in. Um, many people don't understand this, but the blockchain and generally public uh, cryptography of this type is the world's biggest and best single sign-on system. Because by installing a wallet such as any of these in the list, you are automatically compatible with every single Web3 website in the world. You can just log into it, and it works. There's no account system. There's no database holding your accounts. It's all just math. You're logging in with math. But your users need to be educated that they have to keep that private key safe. That's the big caveat. And so on top of this base layer, then, which will be clunky and hard to use because wallets are difficult to use. You have to learn to install them. You have to be safe about them. You have to tell grandma not to click that Facebook link because it's going to hijack her credentials and so on. Once they are educated to not click on suspicious links and do really funky stuff, then you can move on to the next layer. Because now they have their credentials. Now they have an app that runs locally or on IPFS, which is the interplanetary file system, which is basically uh, like a um, torrent-powered hosting system, global hosting system, which 
always keeps any static HTML and JS online regardless of anything. So that's a perfect hosting solution. And the blockchain is a database, okay. And so on top of, this is gonna be hard to use. They have to learn, you know, you have to sign, you have to sign a message cryptographically in MetaMask, there's a pop-up that pops out, it's confusing, it can be confusing, people need to be handheld to this, to, to learn this. It's clunky, it's slow, and when you're fetching data from the blockchain directly, again, it's quite slow, it can take a while to fetch it, to process it, to show it to the user, it's uncomfortable to use, but it's unstoppable, it works. It's like being ready for a apocalypse with a Lada Niva, it will never die. It will never, never betray you, that car. But it's okay to also have a better car in the garage, you know, for leisure until the apocalypse happens. So you have this base stack. Then on top of it, you can run your server. On the server, you can have the indexer and the database that speeds these queries up, that has background jobs that query the, the blockchain that stores that information in the cache and then presents it to the user in a much faster way. Then you can put the CDN on top so that the page itself loads faster and not just via IPFS. But the page itself has these switches built in where if the indexer is unavailable, it's not going to die. It will just fall back to its base layer. It will just work again in a clunky way. Reliably, but clunky. Lada Niva. And then... CDN, same thing. If the CDN is not available, all right, fall back to IPFS. Let's fetch it from IPFS. Let's get it from other users. It's going to work. All right. Layer two, let's move on. Then we make things even smoother. A custodial wallet. That's a wallet service that's hosted by something like privy.io, which provides a Web3 experience that is very native looking. You can log into it with your social logins like Google or Apple, and it generates your wallet from that. You can export it out later, but it's very simple to use, and there's no transactions to sign. It's wonderful. You have third-party APIs to speed things up even more, and you have a lot of integrations on the website, but if any of them fail, nothing happens to your app. If the tyrannical world police, known as the USA, tells your hosting provider, no, shut these guys down, they do not get to have this information on there, they will shut down what they can, yes. And your Twitter API will disappear, and your CDN will disappear, and maybe your social logins will disappear. Maybe you will stop getting service from DigitalOcean because they were blocked from providing you with your indexer, but your app will still work. And they will not be able to stop you. Now, this might sound a little familiar to progressive web apps, which in a way it is, but it's in the opposite direction. Progressive web apps focus more on mobile experiences so that you can install the app as a native home website in your phone. And it basically works offline for most assets, but queries recent state online all the time. Um, it's not a, a competition between the two. They work really well together. So if you can, combine them. Make your progressive web app in such a way that it actually works clunkily but is easily optimizable by all of those other layers on top. And then you get the holy grail of applic un unstoppable applications. A mobile application that is also unstoppable and can be made smooth by other improvements on top. And this is how you reach the widest possible audience. This is how you make a change in the world when you're building actually revolutionary software that you don't want people to take down. And this is how you can actually build a legacy that will, you know, outlast you. So what is the point of all this? Just the ability to say no. You need to be able to say no. It's okay if you don't want to say no. It's okay if you want to keep trusting banks. If, oh, so it's okay if you want to keep trusting governments. It's okay if you want to rely on the insurance of 100,000 euro that your bank provides you in case you lose everything. Fine, that's okay, it's, there's nothing wrong with that. But knowing that there is an option to say no, I think is very, very important. Because when shit hits the fan, it's gonna stink everywhere. And by then, it will be too late to teach people about this. Because they will no longer be able to reach this information. It will be blocked by the government that is throwing the shit at the fan. So you should prepare for this ahead of time. You should at least experiment with it. Launch a simple thing, launch a hello world, launch a 
counter app. Launch whatever you want, but use these technologies. Just explore them. Just see how they work. See what, what happens. Maybe, maybe it interests you. Maybe you discover a passion. Or maybe you just get a new skill that you will be able to put to use when things do go wrong. And when AWS is down again. And when you will want to have decentralization and resistance to censorship and resistance to just you know, being told what to do. So yeah, make things that outlast you, build a legacy by building eternal apps. Build stuff that nobody can stop. Don't, don't allow them to tell you to stop. That's it for me, I have time, time for questions. Um, the, the domain has not yet propagated, I'm sorry, so this is gonna be live any day now. Um, but I'm reachable at any of these, like Telegram, email, and Twitter. You can, you can hit me up, and I will link you to resources or whatever you need about this. Yeah. Thanks, Bruno. Any questions? Where do you, is the uh, mic? Do you need a mic? Yeah. Ah, coming. I think we're recording, so that's why. Thank you. So... Apart from um, example websites, tryouts, hello worlds, counters that I've seen uh, with Web3, are there already actually services that are using Web3? Of course, uh, there's plenty of services that are using Web3. We have mainly, like for example, um, have you heard of the Ethereum name system? Okay, so the ENS is like a global directory of usernames. And it's a decentralized registrar of domain names. If you buy that domain name, it's registered in a smart contract on the blockchain, which means that it's there forever. You can map it to any address that you like, and you can even add custom records to it, just like you would to name servers to A records, text records, C name records on a domain, on a regular domain. The difference is, it's not controlled by six servers across the world, like the DNS system is. This one is global, and it will forever be available, which means that if you send me crypto to bruno.eth, I will get it, no matter what, no matter when. It, it will come to me. Uh, additionally, if you go to bruno.eth in any browser that supports Ethereum name system, you will find my blog, which is itself hosted on IPFS and decentralized. And so there are these applications. Of course, there are a lot of garbage applications in Web3. There is a lot of what they call DeFi, decentralized finance, which is essentially just a glorified casino and serves very little purpose. But more and more utilities are being discovered. Um, as new tech stacks are being built, games are starting to utilize this for cross-game uh, collectibles and items for trading between you know, like different game engines, different game publishers, and so on. Um, this might seem trivial, but the gaming industry is much bigger than the movies and music industry combined, and especially the part about collectibles, skins, cosmetics, and so on. Fortnite, for example, has I don't know how many dozens of billions of dollars traffic per year just on skins. Um, this is a huge business, and so why would studios go to Web3 with this if they have full control of it in their own game? Well, because there's this concept known as royalties, where every time you sell something, it automatically trickles down a part of that sale to the author of that thing. So if I make a piece of art and I sell it, and then somebody else sells it on, I will still get a percentage of that sale that happened later. Um, the same is true for these skins, cosmetics, and games, and so on. When they trade them, even across games, I sell a, you know, a knife skin from Fortnite into Counter-Strike or whatever, a percentage of that is going to go to the developer. And this pile of money is irresistible to these AAA publishers. So they're already trying to experiment with this. Epic Games is like now getting big into NFTs, for example. Um, there are many different applications, many different types that, that you know, have. Um, one of the most beautiful examples of true decentralization and true middle fingerism to the US is the Tornado Cash project. Tornado Cash was an anonymous smart contract that allowed you to put money in there and then as others put money into that smart contract, it would mix. And so you could, at any point in the future, anonymously withdraw it to any other address out, which means that you would basically wash your crypto of traces of any transactions it did before. Because blockchains are public, you can trace every single piece of transaction that you've ever done way back to the very beginning. And so sometimes you may wish to start clean and, and clean that up. Um, when the US decided 
no more, you are now going to stop providing this service to people, they could do nothing. Because this, the front end itself was decentralized, the smart contract is on the blockchain, and that's it. All they stopped was the centralized versions of that front end. But everything else stayed online, and people are still using it um, just, just, as they, just as they were before. It's a little harder to use because it's a little harder to reach because they didn't approach it with progressive centralization in mind. So you have to now find this decentralized front end in order to interact with it. But it exists, and it's, it's functional. So there's a lot of these different use cases. Most of them are designed to remove intermediaries. Book publishers find it very interesting to publish their own work on, um, on these systems so that royalties stick with them and they don't earn three cents on the dollar for every book sale that they do. Instead, they earn 97%. You know? um, additionally, you can also see that as people buy these digital creative works, uh, they have other perks attached to them. So the, the sellers have direct contact with the people who buy their stuff, which means that artists and musicians have direct contact with everybody who's buying their work, who's their fan, um, opposite to how it works right now, you know. So there's, yeah, a lot of, a lot of different examples. I think that Thanks. was a very detailed answer. <laughs> yes. Thanks. Right. Any other questions? Uh, the same T-shirts. Hmm. Something, something suspicious is there. Uh, this is not much of a question. Question. It's more of a thank you for spreading information and a simple gesture for you. So, thank you. Any thank other you. questions? I'm surprised. You know, there is one very simple, provocative question that I didn't hear. Not about the light bulbs. Uh, uh, I was waiting for a question, should we buy Bitcoin or not? But that's not, that's not a good question. So no, no need to answer. Thanks, Bruno. Thank you.